It's time for Twig this week in Google. Jeff Jarvis is here, Aunt Pruitt, and Kevin Tofel. We're going to talk about uh, the new Google Music and how it all works, the new YouTube Music. Don't be evil. It's no longer Google's motto. Does that make any difference? And inside Facebook's deletion center in Berlin. It's all coming up next on Twig. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 458, recorded Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. The Queen in Green. This Week in Google is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twig. It's time for Twig this week in Google. We got a great panel. We're going to have some fun today. Jeff Jarvis is here in his office. It's nice to have you. Is that a newspaper uh, news delivery bag behind you? No, it's from um, VidCon. Be, oh, says, be critical uh, of the media you love. Be critical of the media you love, oh. yes. See, I was hoping it was like a paper boy's bag. That would be good. I'll have to find one. I have one, one at home you? somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have one for the New York Mirror, I think. Another classic. In Jeff Chicago today. <laughs> the paper that I had no tomorrow. <laughs> Jeff is a professor of journalism at the City University of New York and uh, still remembers how a typewriter smells. <laughs> also, Stacy has the week off, but guess who's here in her place? Her good friend and co partner in podcasting, Mr. Kevin Tofel. Uh, hey, hey. Also, Kevin's new website, which got you got a big scoop uh, about Chromebooks.com. We'll talk Just about that. Just today. In a yeah. Yep. Big scoop. And we're thrilled to have Ant Pruitt back Yay! on. Yay! <laughs> He's a contributor to Tech Republic. He is a uh, great photographer, drone pilot, and a uh, Friday night video guy on YouTube. So, Ant, is that computer <laughs> next to you actually just like Steve Gibson's shelves? It's just a prop with lights in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy, this is a tool, not a prop. <laughs> we had to make him turn it off the last time he was on because it, it was so noisy. It was so oh, really <laughs> the fans were so loud. All these fans in this thing, but I think I got you squared away no, now. No, it sounds great. A little closer to my pipes. That's all it needs to be. Just get that <laughs> get that that sound, man. And you need a liquid cooled chair me. next to that thing. <laughs> a liquid cooled chair. I love it. Always good to have all three of you on. Talk about the week's news, and there's a breaking story, which uh, somebody, I think it was Ant, mentioned that just came in. Uh, the um, the Tao uh, Knight, no, not the Tao Knight, you're the Tao Knight, the Knight First I'm Amendment Tao. Institute at Columbia yes. University um, sued, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard of, sued President Trump on behalf of eight people who he had blocked on Twitter. The premise, which... <laughs> the, uh, well, the premise is that the president of the United States shouldn't be able to block people. And the judge has just ruled that's correct. Judge Naomi Rice Buchwald of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York said President Trump's Twitter account is a public forum and blocking people who reply to his tweets with differing opinions constitutes viewpoint discrimination. That's a violation of the First Amendment. That is just bizarre that we've come to this point in the world where this is a heavy-duty issue. What's interesting is, and she wrote a 75-page opinion on this, he could, <laughs> he could have ignored the reply tweets. She says that's right. not unconstitutional, but you can't, you can, in other words, you can mute them, but you can't block them. She said muting preserves the muted account's ability to reply to a tweet sent by the muting account, Blocking says you can't reply. Not only and that that is a distinction. The block user can neither see nor reply to block users' tweets entirely. Muting means you can see Trump's tweets and respond to them. It's just that he won't see them. And she says that's not unconstitutional. Um, she did not order Trump or the assistant to the president, Daniel Scavino, uh, to unblock the individual plaintiffs or prohibit them from blocking others. She said a declaratory judgment should be sufficient. 
I, so, you, so there's a right to speak, there's a right to hear, and there's a right to be heard. Isn't yes, that interesting? But, but you know what? One of the one of the folks in the chat room says he asked for this, and I think that's the crux of it right there. He's chosen to use this as a presidential platform, and that changes the game in terms of First Amendment. Yeah. I think. Yeah. That's what differentiates it from us doing it versus exactly. the POTUS. But he can uh, he can block people from press conferences. It has. That is that unconstitutional. <clears throat> well, that that's a case where. Um, uh, again, I split this up. There's a, there's a new book out by a professor named Anony at USC talking about the right to hear, to not have things you need to know as a citizen blocked out by noise. Then there's the right to be heard. And I don't think anybody would say that you have a right to be heard. Right. Um, and you so, have a right to no, speak, but not be heard. Right. Right. <laughs> and the internet is all built for speaking. Right. <coughs> not listening. Wow. Wow. Okay, well, that's the that's the breaking news just happened. Um, Is anybody here blocked by him out of curiosity? I don't follow him. I have tried and tried and tried <laughs> everything I can to be blocked by him. <laughs> I am Why blocked. am I not surprised? How can you tell I if you're blocked? blocked? Oh, because when you try to read him, it would say no. Oh, no, then I'm not blocked. But I I've am never blocked. replied to him either. You don't want Does he ever use Facebook at all? I know he's no. pretty heavy with Twitter. I've no. never is, seen is there a, any a Facebook Trump traffic from him. No, isn't that interesting? And Facebook is far too complicated for him. He likes Twitter. He's my beautiful <laughs> Twitter account. I'm sorry, Jeff. And you said, and you said, I am blocked by Donald Trump Jr. Oh, okay. What'd you do? <laughs> That's proxy blocking. And by Roger Stone. Oh, what'd you say? Oh, I don't even want to. I have no idea. You don't know. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, it's weird, though, that we live in this day and age where. This is now like a heavy judicial matter. First Amendment matter. It's very strange. Um, did you see 60 Minutes on Sunday? Anybody? I did not, so you're going to have to summarize it. Mm -mm. They had two things that were uh, germane to uh, our conversation here. One was Theranos. And they're really saying, you know, how did we and everybody else get this wrong? Elizabeth Holmes and... They talked about, you know, the end of the line for Theranos and how she's gone from being a billionaire to nothing. And it was fascinating, interesting. I think based on a new a book from a Washington Post. And yet uh, the company stays alive, right? Nobody's well, still... it's it's alive, but it's moribund. I don't... I, well, I thought I got just got an investment. No. Who would yes. put money into Theranos? Uh, somebody who already has money in it. <laughs> Theranos, maybe Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education. Lost maybe, $100 million on it. Lost $100 million. Theranos. I saw something. I could swear. I don't know. Was at one point that. valued at uh, $9 billion. Um, it was, of course, for those who don't know, uh, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, who founded it, was a Stanford freshman who dropped out at the age of 19 because she thought she had discovered a way to do blood tests with a tiny amount, a drop of blood. And founded a company, raised nine billion dollars, or was valued at nine billion dollars at, at at one point. Uh, we're we're going to try to get John Kerry, who wrote the book "Bad Blood: Secrets and Lies in Silicon in the Silicon Valley Startup." Uh, I'm sorry, he's not the Washington Post; he's Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's the guy who wrote that big article that just blew the lid off of it. And now he's got a novel about it. Well, it appears I'm wrong. I I, I could swore I saw that headline two weeks ago, but I don't. I haven't. Uh, big name board members like George Schultz, Carlos Slim, Betsy DeVos, seven hundred million dollars in financing. Uh, at no point did this blood test work, and at, at one point they were really, uh, uh, you know, faking the results. They were going out and taking blood tests and putting them in other machines and saying that the Theranos Edison machine had done it. The uh, SEC sued in March. Uh, both Holmes and uh, the president, Ramesh Sunny Balwani. Holmes settled. She had to give up control of the company, paid a half million dollar fine. In April, the company laid off most of its staff. So, I mean, there's wow. something, there's a there's a, a husk. A uh, here's what I saw. <clears throat> uh, he didn't put any more money in, but Tim Draper said he's still thrilled with his $500,000 uh, <laughs> investment. What else? Well, 500000 he didn't lose as much as some of us. Uh, he defended it and her on CNBC. An extraordinary company was glad to have backed her, glad to have known her personally. Really? 
It was a great mission. She did a great job. I'm thrilled with what she's done. This is on May 18, she, May 12. She really pulled one over on him. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, I, know, I know they they faked the results and such. I'd be curious, Jeff in particular. I mean, and and you know, I write I write for the press. I mean, how much the blame here is on the press in terms of the coverage, the questions? Really the good point, Kevin. Really good point. Yeah. I think I think absolutely a great deal. Um, we we go for we you know we follow the lead we follow the uh, the, the beasts over the cliff. Uh, in promotion, and we don't do our own reporting. We just copy stuff, and we and we look at the clips, and we write it, and that's what we do. Um, I wonder, does anybody know who gets the credit for having blown the whistle on them? Yeah, carry you. Well, oh, he got a, a tip. I don't. Uh, in the in the sixty minutes piece, they talked to a number of former employees, mm -hmm. uh, one of whom did call the uh, I think the SEC or the FTC about it. So uh, I think a number of employees kind of went, "What is going on?" Um, I don't know who gets credit except for Kerry Rue for uh, writing the the that that Wall Street Journal article we all read, right? Uh, that was kind of a shocker. I had we'd all had kind of, I don't know I'd had misgivings for a while about it, but this really blew the lid off it. So the so press Draper wanted says, we all wanted to believe this because she looks like a female mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, right? I mean that that is a great story that we all wanted to tell, and she knew it. That's why she wore black turtlenecks. She played on it. Yeah, related to this, um, I don't know if you guys saw Elon's uh, tweet storm this afternoon. Oh, no. Going on. Yeah, he was going off. <laughs> oh, the press. yeah, well, that's, on the, that's on the rundown. It's there. Oh, this is oh, okay. be oh. All right, let's read it. Let's see. If you're in media and don't want Pravda to exist, Pravda to exist, write an article telling your readers to vote against. He wants to create a media credibility rating site. Oh, let's 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 I can go to the beginning of the tweet storm. That's probably what I should do. Huh? Yeah, the link is there on the rundown. OK, yeah. Um, the holier-than-thou hypocrisy of big media companies who lay claim to the truth but publish only enough to sugarcoat the lie is why the public no longer respects them. And he's linking to an electric.co article that says, Tesla could rally as media negativity is increasingly immaterial, says Baird. Um... Apparently, there's a, a nonprofit that did a long-term study on Tesla safety and things and published it, and he's very upset about it and basically saying journalists are just after clicks and, and they do, you know, keep the advertisers happy, et cetera, et cetera. But this was a nonprofit. They're not even – they don't care about the clicks. Well, is he talking about the revenue. Consumer Reports story? I thought he was at first, but no, he singled out and, and there's a couple threads in there from the company. Jeff, we might know it, um, not react um, – Reveal, oh, uh, reveal, yeah, which is which yeah. is the Center for Investigative Reporting, which is in um, the East Bay, San Francisco area. And he also uh, uh, smashed them personally. Oh, said that I should were, mention were... that my son uh, worked for them uh, the past oh. last summer. Oh, really? Um, oh, it's, wow! It's, it's, you never told me that. Yeah, it's run by oh, the uh, I'm, uh, probably a compadre of yours, former Examiner um, editor in chief Phil Bronstein. Bronstein. Uh, and Reveal is there. So they've been, they've been around for a while. And Reveal was their uh, new kind of product they just Brand. launched last year yeah. to, to make it be more uh, hip. Yeah, so, so Musk said there were a bunch of, 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 of political science students who paid too much attention to their professor. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. He does not like the bad news. And he's been getting a lot of it. Consumer Reports said the braking distance on the Model 3 is among the worst they've ever seen. Oh. They actually bought a second Model 3 because they couldn't believe how bad it was, and it performed just as badly. Tesla's response was, that doesn't match our test results at all. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, and of course, he, uh, a couple of weeks ago, flamed a, an analyst and refused to answer his questions. Boring, stupid. Elon's, yeah, I remember that. Elon's getting a little cranky. My, uh, my tweet was that he's finally met his match, that he's never had to deal with the failings of people. Yeah, right. Even even PayPal, yeah. those banking laws. It's, it's just it's it's money. Uh, Zip two was yellow pages and stuff. Uh, current companies hardware. Uh, you get into into what's true and who believes what, and who trusts what. Good luck, Elon. Something happens when you get uh, you know you get this much power and this much money. You stop living in the real world, and I think it just takes. You believe a your own PR. It takes yeah. a little while, but it it happens. <laughs> To, I think everybody that you start 
um, yeah, you start getting you get a little weird. So I saw it happen after my first billion. Then that's yeah, the reality. right. I'm like, no, hey. Kevin, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kevin, can't, I, can't we got to tell you, we've we've said it. You've never been the same. I I know. <laughs> don't be like Elon, and don't be like Kevin. <laughs> so Elon's response is, I'm going to create. This was a couple hours ago a site where the public can rate the core truth of any article and track the credibility score over time of each journalist, editor, and publication, thinking of calling it Pravda. How many times, how many times have I seen that exact idea from people like him who get pissed off that somebody got something wrong in the press, which is a problem, and it's true, and we've all experienced that, but uh, what we're doing with this because you ought to be a rating. That'll, that'll solve it all. Why hasn't I done that? Well, it's. Have you ever seen the comments on YouTube or any site? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's that's yeah, what let's, let's that's have what them those judgment. comments are. Um, and of course, there's Slashdot and Dig and Reddit, all of which uh, have karma scores. I don't think any of them are journalistic um, exemplars. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what, Elon? I I I have a Tesla. I love my Tesla. Uh, I think Elon's done a lot of good to the world, but I think there he also maybe is not reacting well to. Uh, you're right. Maybe I mean, he's you're going to have some bumps in the road. Just yeah. just overcome them. Put right. your head down and work on it. You want to prove him wrong? Succeed. Continue to yeah. succeed. And I, you know, I respect him a lot. He he took the oh, money yeah. he made from PayPal and risked it all on SpaceX and uh, Tesla. I don't. I, I admire him. And it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a very good thing. Yeah. I don't think we'd see electric cars. Every company in the world is trying to make electric cars now. I mean, there's a number of reasons. There's governmental pressure. But uh, but I think the fact that uh, Tesla has done so well and proved the market has helped a lot. Uh, so Mark We're Harris, um, uh, a scientific writer for The Economist, said uh, uh, regarding Musk, or he's not kidding, folks. I noticed... Uh, that one of Musk's agents had incorporated Pravda Corp in California back in October last year. I was wondering what this was all about. Pravda, for those who don't know, is the famous uh, Soviet uh, mouthpiece uh, newspaper. It's not still, and, is Pravda still around? I don't think so, is it? I don't know, but, but and, and Pravda means truth. Yeah, but of course that was ironic. <laughs> yes. <exactly. laughs> um, yeah, Pravda. It says circulation of 100,000 on uh, Wikipedia. It's still around. Pravda.ru. Um, were, were Musk's earlier efforts ever publicly owned companies before he sold them? Um, Zip2. I don't know whether it, well, certainly wasn't um, PayPal. He before sold, he sold them is the question. Did they go public first? Yeah, just, I'm, I'm just thinking he's under pressure from shareholders. He's not used to this. He's never maybe. been before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not justifying his reactions by any means, but you know, that's, that's the difference I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Prof just pretty much uh, the same <laughs> kind of, kind of the news of the world publication that, it always yeah, it's it's been it's been found. You know, it's been part of these efforts to um, spread lies. Yeah, it's it's a vector. Yeah. Um. So the second thing on uh, sixty minutes was actually the bigger well, story for us. Distract you, yeah. Which is <laughs> uh, Google, and uh, a really kind of I would say a, a kind of classic sixty minutes hit piece on Google. With with the standard, no, they read up on it. The standard attacker, the one who will always be guaranteed to attack Google and press go, go right to him. Uh, let's uh, quote Ben Thompson from Stratechery. The 60 Minutes report was not exactly fair and balanced. It featured an anti-tech monopoly crusader, an anti-tech monopoly activist, an anti-tech monopoly regulator, and Yelp CEO Jeremy Stoppelman. And in what seems highly go. unlikely to have been a coincidence, Yelp this week filed a new antitrust complaint in the EU against Google. Yep, there we go. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> Yelp did a blog post about the 60 Minutes feature in which they included a several-year-old uh, video that explains how anti-competitive Google is. Um, <laughs> ben points out the answer box that Yelp, there are three, Yelp appears to be, Yelp's position appears to be that Google's answer box is anti-competitive because it only includes reviews and ratings from Google. Presumably the situation could be resolved were Google to use sources like Yelp. There are three big problems with this argument. First, the answer box did used to include content from Yelp 
until they complained. <laughs> so Google <laughs> stopped doing so when the FTC, under pressure from the FTC in 2013. Second, in a telling testament to the power of being on top of search results, Google's ratings and reviews have improved considerably in the two years since the video was posted. This isn't a static market. Third, and this is the point of this article, what Yelp seems to want will only serve to make Google stronger. And then Ben delves into his trademarked deep dive on the difference between platforms and aggregators. Uh, and actually, I think one of the quotes, which which is uh, he he uh, he quotes uh, Chamath uh, Palihapitiya in an interview. Uh, but when asked about, uh, Chamath was at Facebook. When asked, do you see any similarities from your time at Facebook with Facebook platform and connect and how Uber may supercharge their platform? Chamath said, neither of them are platforms. They're both kind of like these comical endeavors to do you as an nth priority, that do you as an nth priority. I was in charge of Facebook platform. We trumpeted it out like it was some hot stuff, big deal. We raised money from Bill Gates. Uh, Gate, when, when that $15 billion raise happened a few months after Facebook platform, and Gates said something along the lines of, that's a crock of BS. This isn't a platform. And this is, I love this line, a platform, this is Bill Gates, is when the economic value of everybody that uses it exceeds the value of the company that creates it, then it's a platform. Ooh. Yes. Strong. Good definition. I love that. I, I always say that a platform, you, you know you have a platform when users put it to a use you did not anticipate when they that's, take it over. That's good. And ultimately that leads to economic value. Yes. So he says, so Windows was a platform. Yes. iPhone is not a platform because Apple captures the vast majority of the uh, ecosystem. So, <laughs> you know, it's not a platform. So he makes a distinction between aggregators and platforms in the aggregator business. And this is, uh, this is something uh, Ben hits on a lot. This idea of the yeah. aggregator business model the aggregator owns the customers, the suppliers follow. So Google is not a platform. Facebook is not a platform. But as aggregators, Google has the luxury of operating in an environment, the World Wide Web, that was by default completely open. That let the best technology win, and that win was augmented by the data that comes from serving an ever-increasing part of the market. The end result was the integration of end users and data feedback cycle that made Google search better and better the more it was used. So, um, anyway, I could it was a hit piece. See, I could vaguely see Google as a platform because of all of the other things that it has under its umbrella that not only just regular consumers get to use, but companies are able to use to, to get work done, you know, under the Google brand. Except that, uh, according to Ben's definition, the beneficiary of all that is Google, not the third parties yeah right so that's that's classic aggregator um so anyway um uh, i know that, that's a little off from our initial conversation which was 60 minutes why are they just piling on as uh, regulators government and regular people start to hate these facebook it's, and now google no, is, it, I, is it google's turn Oh, it was Google's turn before, and then it was. Then they got they kind of bled it dry. Then they went to Facebook, and then when it got a supply of blood back, they're going after Google again. I'm sorry, it's my business, but it's a media narrative, and media are in a position of conflict of interest because media think that Google stole their advertisers, which they didn't, but that's where it is, and so media keep going after them. And right now, it's just the cool thing to do to go after technology, right, and to blame everything on technology. I'm looking at Vigor in the chat room, um, and he says, he or she says, how is Google's Android not a platform? Can we consider Android a platform? I would, I would, I would. say so, just because of the, the televisions and phones and everything else yeah. that, that people build around it. Yeah, and Google you know. gives it away, so it's the, it's the, uh, it's well, the third party. Well, they get parties. back, too. They get back because they get the data. They get the search data. Right. There's always well, I mean, that. Even... The, even <laughs> And even even the advertising is a platform to the extent that it enables you to create a business that you wouldn't be able to create well, otherwise. That's you Ben's build point. something on it. That's Ben's point is that Yelp has, you know, entire business was predicated on Google doing their customer acquisition for them. You know, hmm. Yelp succeeded because of Google. Yeah. 
Uh, it seems a bit rich, he says, that Yelp should be free to leverage its app to avoid Google completely. That demand that Google continue to feature Yelp prominently in its search results, particularly on mobile, when the answer box where the answer box has particular utility. So, uh, by the way, Yelp. When I go to Yelp site, I get peed off. I know. Not very good. It's not very good. That's Google's <laughs> position. No. Google says, "Well, we <laughs> we just try to give people the result, the best results." And it's right. So here, here's the irony of where we are. Want. So on the one hand, people say you should be open to everything and equal to everything as if there's such a thing. And, and, and then on the other hand, when people do, start doing bad things on the platform, we tell the platforms, you should be ju making judgments and getting rid of bad stuff. They can't win either way, yeah. except for the fact that they're the biggest companies on earth and they're very rich. Then they win. Is, um, is it mean anything that Google removed the don't be evil clause from its code of contact? <laughs> Isn't that an old story? Didn't they do that like a year ago where they, where they updated it? They updated it then. I think this is a, I don't know that this is a legit story. I think this was done quite some time ago. I don't know. They went to the Wayback Machine and they're saying, Gizmodo, this is, uh, is saying that it was there back in April. Oh. Yeah. It, alpha, it alphabet, alphabet changed the motto to do the right thing. That's what you're thinking of. But is that Google, what it is? Yeah, Google always, he says, here's, so they compared April 21st of this year which has this paragraph, don't be evil, you know, on and on, on in the Google Code of Conduct. And then the May 4th version doesn't have that phrase. It was completely rewritten. I suspect that this rewriting has more to do with GDPR than anything else, but I don't, but I don't know. They, they probably, and they get, again, we can't win both sides. They get tons of crap for the don't be evil. People misunderstand it. Right. and think it's a, it's a, it's, it's coming down Moses from the mountaintop with a tablet that says we're not evil. Right. It's not. It says employees prevent us from being evil otherwise because it's bad business yeah i i also i think whether it's true or not it's kind of a tempest in the teapot i don't it is yeah it is uh all right how about the scoop this guy kevin tofel i don't know where he gets his stuff god from bless, i want to say this god bless <laughs> kevin <laughs> tofel about kevin tofel is the one person in all of technology journalism who writes for those who are smart enough to not have gigantic steam powered, atomic powered <laughs> machines like Ant there. See, Ant goes for complication and wants the biggest show off thing possible. That is Kevin not a Chromebook, Ant. I'm guessing that's not that a Chrome no OS device. Mm -hmm. That is a Chrome reactor. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but to be fair, if you're going to process uh, drone videos or, hey, I just got a GoPro Fusion. That thing, even on a on an iMac Pro, takes hours to render the 360 video. You gotta have 360 it. video was tough. You oh, really need some man. horsepower. You really do. But for the for the rest of us, there's this. The this is the Chromebook Yay. Pixel. And you know, this has been a ridiculously premium, as always with Google. This was a thousand dollars starting point. Uh, I love it. It was. It's well worth it. It's the best Chromebook, but it's just a Chromebook. But uh, Kevin's scoop is that uh, Acer's coming along with something that uh, might might uh, give the Pixel book a run for its money. Tell us about it, Kevin. Yeah, so today Acer actually had their uh, Acer Next event in New York City. Um, I did not go, but I was able to find some information about six hours before the event and figured out what they were launching. And, and they actually launched four Chromebooks, uh, two two are more premium, and they are the Chromebook Spin 13, which has a fold-over display, 360 display, mm -hmm. and the regular clamshell Chromebook 13. Uh, these are the first Chromebooks with the 8th gen Intel Core processors, which is pretty mm. hot. Not not as hot as That's Ant's. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's not, not a tank like what you have, but still, 8th uh, gen <laughs> Core i5. Don't be ashamed, <laughs> Kevin. Don't be ashamed. Uh, no, it's Stand all up good. proud, sir. And 16 good. gigs of, up to 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah, which is Pixelbook territory in terms of specs. Right. You know, um, even How the uh, display is uh, 2256 by 1504, oh, which nice. is a little odd, but three by two aspect ratio, again, like the Pixelbook, uh, has a, a Wacom uh, stylus, uh, digitizer rather, with an EMR stylus pen. Ooh. So, you know, this this has potential. Now, that the one thing, somebody, was it Jeff who just asked how much? Yeah. That's, that's the one thing they did not say. Um, unfortunately, the the spin has no price yet. The regular clamshell starts at three ninety nine, but that is more likely the base model with like a 
puny Pentium or a Celeron inside. So um, you're, you're gonna you're gonna pay. I don't know if you'll pay a thousand like a Pixelbook, but you're probably talking seven eight hundred dollars. But not like not ARM on either of these, which is interesting. You gotta pay for those those CPUs at the very minimum. Yeah. And all that Especially ran. early, early in the cycle when they're just being produced and and they're a hot commodity, you know, no pun intended. I mean, a lot of laptop makers want these chips, so it's it's a question yeah. of who's got enough pull. And Acer said that I kind of thought this number was low, but it is still a big number. They said that they have sold more than ten million Chromebooks, and they are among the tops in terms of sales oh. for Chromebooks. So, Kevin, They've which is killing. the uh, the one you wrote about about two weeks ago? Which is, that's going to have the the separable screen. Well, that's uh, we don't know who's making it yet. It's uh, code name Nocturne, and mm -hmm. it will have a detachable display, just like the HP Chromebook X2, which should be out June seventh. Um, what's interesting on, on that one, Jeff, is that it has Pogo pins, just like the iPad, the iPad Pro, and that's what Google is using to determine if it's connected to the keyboard. So my suspicion is, based on their code, that it may be like a flat keyboard, kind of like a Surface or iPad keyboard. Uh, Basically, it's just a big screen and probably a, a thin keyboard, but we'll have to see about that. Interesting. And so, so Kevin, given these that are coming out, um, we have our Chromebook Pixels and we love them. We add yep. them all together. They're about as powerful as Ant's machine, but we're proud of that. Um, <laughs> which one are you uh, on, the, on the higher end, on the better end? Which machine should I be waiting for? That's a toughie. I get that question all the time, actually, because I keep finding all these Chromebooks that are in the works. And when I find them, it's so early in the process, they're right. six to eight months out, right? So we know the HP is coming and that starts at $599 and it's detachable, which I really, really want. I'm not going to go for it, though, because everything, all the cool stuff, the cool kids are playing on Pixelbooks with Linux apps and, and Crouton and all that. So I'm going to stay right. with Pixelbook for now. There's another one I found, Jeff, that has a 4K display. Its code name is Atlas. And again, detachable. And I'm wondering if that's going to be a Google update in the fall. Ah. Mm -hmm. and, but, I, and I probably would wait for a Google Chromebook device because, again, yeah, that that's do. what they develop all the fun toys for, right? right. So that, that's me. I mean, if you're not going to get into the tinkering and the Linux and all that, you know, the HP might do it for you. And that's coming next month. So if I were going to recommend a machine to a colleague and and and, and make sure that they weren't going to whine to me about having too many tabs open. Uh, I mean, there's so many good choices out there. The whole tab thing, just make sure you have at least four, if not eight gig of RAM. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if you can go with at least a Core i3 processor, that should keep them happy for a long time. I mean, that wouldn't render 10 seconds of Ants videos, but hey, you know, <laughs> it'll keep them happy. What uh, what's the story with Crostini? This is the technology that's going to allow us to run Linux apps on the Chromebook. Yeah, still in the works, and Google did announce it at, at I/O. Obviously, yeah. um, in fact, that was the show I was on last, and we talked about it. They're making changes on a daily basis, trying to make it more stable, more secure. Um, I've even found out that they are looking to bring it to old Chromebooks because it's really not about the hardware that it's much. Not performance. It's performance. Yeah. No, it's it's the Linux kernel. Yeah, because uh, they're working with Linux 4.4 on all the supported devices. Now what they're doing is they're trying to backport some of the Linux modules to Linux 3.1 devices. So anything you bought maybe two years ago in terms of Chromebook might be on Linux 3.x. Maybe you'll be able to get Crostini on that. I mean, they're really trying. I, I don't know if they'll succeed, but they're really trying to make it as widespread as possible. And we've already seen them try and it took a long time for Android apps. And there's still a lot of devices that don't support the Google Play Store. So some are skeptical of, of all this whole Christini stuff, and I get that. But, um, you know, we'll see. They're trying. So, Kevin, I don't know if we've discussed this. Um, and if we did, stop me. Uh, but <laughs> there are various, cause, because there's not, we've only had so much to say in life. That's it. Um, <laughs> there's various Android apps that just aren't working well uh, for me on the Chromebook. Start with Skype. It just feels like it's going through 25 layers and, and it's not working well. Whereas Skype on my Android tablet is good. Um, same with Netflix, same with, uh, you know, Showtime to go. Uh, the, these apps just are, 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 are flaky. And is that what your experience? You know, to be honest, Jeff, the apps that I use for Android on my Pixelbook aren't streaming or media apps. I tend to just use the browser for those. Um, I can only give you a guess on what the issue may or may not be here. Um, these may have something to do with the fact that Android is running in a container just like 
Linux is for Christini. Right. Um, and I know with Linux, they don't ex they don't support hardware acceleration yet. They don't even support sound. Like, no, I, I think they I think they announced they're going to have GPU support. They're going to have it, but they don't yet. Uh, yeah, and I okay. just I wonder oh. be, because they're trying to leverage the hardware outside of the Android container. I'm wondering if they're having issues, not they, but the apps are of, of yeah. passing through to make what needs to happen happen. Um, you're not the first person to tell me this with these particular apps. And I actually have passed that on to some of my former teammates over at Google. I didn't get a response yet, but, you know, at least when I they met the head of Chrome at I.O., I, mm -hmm. of course, took the, I took the opportunity to be self-centered and tell him this. Uh, he said he was surprised because he said that Netflix is a huge download. Um uh, one of the leading downloads for Android on on Chrome, uh, but boy, mine is just. Thank you. I I, I I think it is Kevin. Uh, my sense, uh, I might maybe misunderstand this, is that the Android isn't running. Is it just running as a container, or is it running an emulation? It's running in a container. Okay, container. So it's not. A, it's not, not an, an emulation. emulation. No, no, it's not. G Google is is leveraging the the container technology they used for Android. It's not the exact same. But um, I think it's LXC and LXD in Linux, and, and I'm not a huge uh, knowledgeable person about Linux, but my understanding of that's the container technology they're using, which has been around in Linux for a while. Um, I'm also wondering if, and it shouldn't matter, but I'm wondering if because we have Intel-powered devices, maybe some of the ARM Chromebooks aren't having these problems. I don't know. Yeah, I would uh -oh. think it'd be, the, yeah, that makes sense. Um yeah. Okay. So, because so the nice thing about running Linux on a Chromebook is that a Chromebook essentially is Chrome OS is Linux. Correct. So it's yep. not a. It's yes. not. It doesn't really have to, in any way, really kind seamless. of translate calls or anything. It's it's Linux. Uh, Android's not, which is in theory on a, a Linux, but it's not a Linux kernel. Um, I don't, I, now, have you played with Christina yet, Kevin? Oh, every day. I actually was right. going to use the Pixelbook for Skype on Christine on the Pixelbook today for this, but Ooh. I found out I, I couldn't hear anything on a Skype oh, call, so I'm like, well, that's not good. We it's, don't have on the, uh, happen, so. it's on Chrome OS Developer Channel now, right? Right. right. Dev right. 68, Channel 68, yep. Which means it's probably fairly close to coming out. It could be. There was a beta update for Chrome OS just today, I believe, and I don't think it's in there yet. Um, I think Google had said maybe July, August. Um, I think they're kind of over uh, promising and uh, I'm sorry, under promising and over delivering here. I think they want to push it out earlier just based on the schedule, but they're saying July or August. And they, uh, okay. Yeah. Do you have to turn off security on a Chromebook to run the dev channel? No, that, that's the beautiful part of all of this with Christini because with Crouton, you did have to be in developer mode. So you're basically opening up, you know, some security potential yep. issues there. This, you just use the regular non-developer mode, standard Chromebook oh, dev okay. channel. So there's no security issues. You can't even really pass, easily pass data from the Linux container to the Chrome OS system. However, um, I you can mount your files app in Chrome OS to the Linux container folders through secure shell so that's how they're keeping the security of the data passing between the two systems so to speak how do, so nice. i can is it in the settings i can just turn on uh go onto the dev channel yeah if you go into the dev channel in settings and then you'll see a um a new setting in the apps uh, i'm sorry setting uh for enabling linux beta and wow. you might have a bit of a tough time but i can send you some uh some oh, instructions. I can figure there's, it out. No, no, I can yeah, figure it out. Yeah, there's two commands to run. I can't. If it's on can't, my site, Jeff. If you can't I'll figure it out, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> you remember trying to get me working, Leo. You had to talk me through stuff on the show line by line. I remember that. So uh, in the settings, if you look at about uh, Chrome OS, you can see uh, that you can get in a different channel, stable beta or developer unstable. So you have to go to developer for this. Correct. Yeah. Warning. Warning. You're switching to the developer channel. Will Robinson. Contains features Remember, in the progress. You, you, won't, what, you won't lose data by going down, but when you go nice. back you don't up. That's nice. You don't have to rebuild it or anything. Yeah, but when you go back up to beta or sable, it's going to power wash and wipe your data, just That's so fine. you know. That's fine. Cool. So I just, that was, it was that easy. Just to, to under build information, detailed build mm -hmm. information, you just change it. And now it's updating. You'll see and it, you, it. Yeah. Once it's done updating and, and you, you click the top left settings, you'll see you'll have a new option for right. Linux enable. Right. Yeah. I've seen that on your uh, on your site. Yep. Yep. 
Wow, very exciting. So new Chromebooks, uh, Acer just announced, looks like the very, at least the mid-range ones that we've been asking for. Because they've been, you know, the high end and the yeah. low end have been well represented uh, by uh, Google and everybody else, respectively. But it's nice to have something in the mid-range. Acer's done some nice full aluminum body mid-range already. In fact, I think they're making some of the nicest Chromebooks. So I'm glad to I see I always it. want to support these things, but I, it, it's, it's tough because... Nothing I spend can, so much time do with it. <laughs> uh, editing, you know, I, I, I have to spend my time editing and being productive. Right. And yeah, I could run Lightroom on the website, what have you, or, or in some instances run the, the Android, the Android app version. But yeah, that's not going to do what you need to do. You but still need a desktop. I need Photoshop too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got to have Photoshop for certain projects, especially if I'm out doing, say, a headshot shoot or something like that. I, I, I need that productivity and all of these specs from these Chromebooks are just, oh, they're, they're, they're great. But the back of my mind is like, you'll never have one. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids might have one, Ant. So what would it yeah, take, yeah, what would it take to make um, cloud-based editing like you do possible? What's the speed necessary? What's the processor? What's the memory? What, uh, it's, it's more processing local? and processing and even I want to say there was one app out there that tried to give you cloud video editing where right. you sent up your 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 edits to the cloud and it came back down and that just took forever. It did whatever I wanted it to do, but it was so slow because of the syncing back and forth. You know, a, a, a five minute HD video could be, you know, almost a gig in size. But I and thought you're trying to render the, that back and sorry. forth. And you're trying I, I to render that back and forth just takes too long. But 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 does it have to go back and forth? Um, if you upload the entire video to online, and all of the mm -hmm. processing happens up in the cloud, and all you're doing is seeing it, yeah, but on your you machine. need to interact with it, uh, Jeff. So you could, I, you know, what they could do is have a low quality version locally that you do edit an edit list on, something like that. If you right, had enough right. bandwidth, I think it would it's doable, especially if you, if because you, you have the, the servers bandwidth. could be very very powerful. You could use, you know. Google's cloud right. and stuff to do it. If you had the bandwidth, that that would be the only thing. Yeah. You know, when How I was big are these files out, that you're working with? Again, like I said, a, a five minute HD video could could be a, a gig at minimum, yeah. depending on yeah. your your effects and, and your other audio editing and things like that. You know, and that's that's just for five minutes. And my videos are always longer than five minutes. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty long winded when it comes to my videos. There's no reason to jump through hoops like this either. I mean, we, you have hardware, local hardware that, that can do it. That's a perfectly reasonable thing. You've got to use the tool that's right for the job. I mean, yeah, I, I just want for things like students to be able to edit video without the expense. Right. I just mm -hmm. wish there was a better relationship between the folks at Google Alphabet and the likes of Adobe or even whoever else is out there creating mm -hmm. these different nonlinear editors and, and photo editors because... The, the need is there, um, but I just can't buy in until I have something proven that's going to allow me to go to a client and do what I need to do right there without running through proxies and, and jumping mm -hmm. through all these hoops It and stuff. feels like Adobe's working on this. They're moving more and more to the cloud. They're trying, but even with, like I said, even with the, the Lightroom, uh, Lightroom Mobile or Lightroom CC, whatever it's called, yeah, Creative I use classic. it from time yeah. to time, but it ain't. Oh, you don't uh, like? You're still with classic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I still go back to the classic. Yeah, I keep going back to the classic too. <laughs> um, they don't you, like you could you could remote into that big old barrel that's sitting next to you there, Ant. But I mean, it's probably Believe still. Believe it or not, I've done it's, that. <laughs> really? Like, you could you could do that with a Chromebook, but if it's not as Leo said, I and I agree 100. percent You got to use the best tool for the task, and if Chromebook's not your thing for your tasks, and you shouldn't buy a Chromebook, without a doubt. Right? It's nice to have I have a uh, Chromebook 2 back there in the corner somewhere. I have one of the Toshiba Chromebook 2s. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That will not it's, do it, it for was, you, no. no. <laughs> and it was, but it was fast. It was fast for just general, regular people use. You know, if you want to browse the web, you want to watch Netflix or whatever. If I wanted to write an article, that thing was great. But if I wanted to edit some raw files, there, there are a couple apps out there. But it's still it, it it took a little work. But will we will will the trajectory get us to a point where you know again not you but doing three sixty half hour video, but 
but for users and students and families to be able to edit video effectively on the on, on the cloud, is there is there a point in time we're going to get there? I wish I knew. I, I would have assumed it was around the corner no. because there are so many. Uh, there's a couple of different apps on mobile devices that allow you to do video editing and, and photo editing at a decent scale, but. People do I'm it on sorry, iPads all the time. I mean, this is this mm -hmm. is one place where Apple has a pretty good advantage in schools. You can do all of that in iPads. You can shoot the movie on an iPad. You can edit it. You can, uh, I mean, you can do it all on an iPad. Uh, I, yeah, there's a handful of apps out there, a handful, but not for Well, everybody. you can't do what you're doing. So professional mm -hmm. productions can always, I think this is just, I mean, you're not going to make an album. You're not going to edit a video you're not going to launch rockets on a chromebook they're, they're, for those kinds of professional uses you're going to have heavy duty computers why shouldn't you but i think what jeff i think what I'm, you're asking is there is a segment the education segment where they would like to be able to do this kind of stuff yes that's what i'm saying great i think it they can but they can do it on an ipad they can't do it on a chromebook yet and that's that's a that's a failing on the google's part i think google's part. okay apple's mm. really put a lot of effort into making right. sure that it has i every every ipad comes with iMovie yeah, it come you know, uh, it comes with all the iWork suite. It comes, you know, they've got built-in camera. It's it's kind of made to do that, and that's one of the things Apple shows schools all the time. And I fa and I know, in fact, you know, our kid who has an i had an iPad in sixth grade. That's what they were doing is making movies. So does Google just you know, believe in the cloud too much that I don't want to that it doesn't want to do things locally? It it only wants to do cloud. And that's the that's the gating factor. That's a good question because again, you have people like Acer that are putting these products out here year after year that are clearly capable, but there's, <laughs> there's nothing being done about it from the software standpoint. Yeah. You know, Apple kind of benefited from the fact that Adobe screwed Steve jobs <laughs> and Steve was furious and said, we're going to develop apps and we're going to put Adobe out of business. And the chief thing they did is acquire Final Cut and make Final, Final Cut a Cut. very powerful video editing platform and then make it available and, or something like it available on all their hardware. So yeah. it's almost a historic a historical accident that Apple has an advantage there. But they, I mean, they clearly do have an advantage there. And I think that Google could pr probably should now that I haven't really ever thought about this, but probably should put some effort into making uh, a Chromebook because I think that's one of the things schools want to do. <laughs> yeah, no, you just web apps to do it. Sorry, I don't think you, I don't think you're going to be web apps. I think you need. No, yeah, that's it's going to be Android. I think. Yeah, Android. but, Maybe but that's but, why but Android's see there. See my prior discussion. Android is not ready for this. No. If it no. can't display Netflix well, it can't. You can't edit Netflix. Yeah. So I have there, uh, the, the, the dev channel is on here, and yes, lo and behold, there is a. Uh, let's see. Let's get the glare off that screen. I don't know. Can you zoom in on that, Josh, a little bit? It's right here. There it is. Linux beta. And I can tap that. Here we go. Let's do it again. Uh, it should oh. install a terminal. After Turn on, point. it says. Okay. Terminal. Oh, so the first thing it does is terminal. Now, there is a, there was a terminal. There's Croche. Well, that's that's pretty bare bones. This is an actual terminal. You'll, you'll okay. see. Oh, that's nice. Does it, 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 the terminal does SSH. Does it do Mosh? I have a very nice Mosh extension. I told you about Mosh. You did. Yeah, you very, did. very nice Mosh extension I use in Chrome OS. Um, so I can, in effect, I, I, I just Mosh into my server at home, my Debian server at home, and use it that way. Um, but this will actually make these local, so I guess they'll work offline and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so now starting container inside Termina VM. So Termina is more than a terminal. It's a... Uh, Termina is, is the actual um, container. So this would be... Now, there are some video editing tools. There are tools on Linux, but nothing that polished. This would be a great opportunity. Google's got some mm -hmm. good resources and talented yeah. programmers. What a great opportunity for them to make an open source uh, classroom quality. So it doesn't have to be file cut. It, it has to be iMovie right. video editor. Now, one more thing as far as the education. This is just something that reminded me of an experience a couple of weeks ago here in my home. Uh, something happened on my computer. I believe it was, you know, I was running a Plex server and I'm trying to watch it downstairs and it, and it didn't work. So I needed to have the system reboot. So I yell upstairs to one of my, my boys and say, <laughs> hey, I said, hey, I need y'all to restart the Plex server for me. And he walks over to the computer and I say, go to the start menu and I already have it pinned there in the start menu. 
he didn't know what a start menu was. Oh, wow. Uh, and it's because they spend so much time in the Chromebook world. Uh, he was like totally beside himself. Now, granted, he will come to this desk and sit and fire up a Fortnite or whatever, you know, to do what they need to do for, for school or what have you. But he had no idea about going in and out of the, the application menu here and, and stuff like that or looking at the services, you know, but they so, don't teach that. So Termina <laughs> is now installed. What's the next thing you do? Uh, next thing you want to hit is um, you want to open up Crush. So it's uh, Control-Alt-T, I believe. All right. There's the, uh, mm -hmm. the old shell. Mm -hmm. And then what? Now like Crush, you want to right? type... VMC. Let me see. I don't see anything yet. Hold on. Where's my command line? Let's yeah, where's your command line? There it is. It's some some somewhere off screen. VMC. Space start space termina. So this is the virtual machine and termina mm -hmm. is the terminal that's gonna start. Maybe I maybe I'm not really in Crush, what's going on? This has to be the best twig ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. VMC start. I don't know what's going on. Let me try this again. And my eyes are like wide open. I'm like, what's going to happen let's, next? Let's close this. Control Alt T. <laughs> I don't, you know, I wonder if it's because I have Mosh on there or something. I don't see the. Uh, that could be. Let's uh, make it smaller. That doesn't help. Um, hmm. Check and check and see in your um, your app list if you have a terminal. Yeah, maybe that's it's been flaky lately, but maybe yours will work. Huh? No. This is so much fun. Aren't you glad you watched the show today? You can search on top. What is that? Art canvas in a folder. Yeah, T E R. Maybe just restart. Terminal, should I? <laughs> yes. Launch? Yeah. Terminal. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't. And it's, it's the same problem. It doesn't. So, uh, what was it? Termina. Hmm. Start. No, it's VMC. No, start. It's VMC, VMC start. Start. Termina. Termina. Right. I think that's virtual machine console. Yeah. So I don't know what's going on. It yeah. Rats. You're, well, there you go. That's why you want to That's install well Linux on your Chromebook. <laughs> I'll just keep rebooting until it works. It, it, could be, it, could, it, could be, it could be that you have Mosh on there because I know they're using the Secure Shell app as a conduit here between Chrome OS and the Linux container. Yeah. So you may want to get the official Secure Shell. I'll just take that, it. That I might have it. some extensions on there that are causing problems. Yeah. Okay, no big deal. I'll keep banging on it. You so see, that's how you July do it, though. July, August of 2023. There you go. <laughs> um, let's take a break. When we come back, lots more to talk about. The Hydrogen One, a new Android phone that is wildly ambitious and wildly expensive. Uh, and I want to, yeah. somebody's going to have to explain to me what this new YouTube music is and how it's different from Google Play music. And whether it still includes Google Play. And, uh, and yeah, <laughs> and what, what's going on? Google's so good at confusing people. And then Jeff uh, will give us his uh, handwritten notes on Mark Zuckerberg's meeting with the European Parliament. No, you didn't watch either. Probably it was in the it. middle of the night. Yeah, I didn't watch. Uh, yeah, we haven't done much Facebook stuff, so we have a I get, You know, I get nervous for him. I know. he's He's got this, always seems to like have a thin sheen of sweat uh, on him. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's if he's actually sweating or his face is dipped in plastic. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't add to his human you know humanity. Let's put it that way. Uh, all right, our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from uh, Quicken Loans. The folks at Quicken Loans are watching with great interest tonight. What is it? Game five of the NBA playoffs: the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics. Of course, uh, the Quicken Loans. Uh, founder uh, Dan Gilbert is uh, is the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He'll be watching with interest. He's been really instrumental in revitalizing downtown Detroit. Quicken Loans is an amazing company, fascinating company. Number one lender in the country now. Number one in customer satisfaction eight years in a row. And they realized something that I think was a kind of an eye opener. They they realized that the way it worked. Here you are on top. Everybody loves your stuff. 
this is what you look for in a company. And they said, no, it's not good enough. The way it works isn't right. It's to, it, we, we think the mortgage experience needs a client-focused technological revolution. It needs to keep up with the time. So they reinvented it, and they came up with Rocket Mortgage, an entirely online mortgage approval process. And they're justifiably proud of this thing, and, and they ought to be. Last time I bought a house four years ago, Lisa and I had to go to a bank. The, the guy had a sheaf of papers with all the latest rates, and, a, and he was very proud of his mortgage calculator. <laughs> And he, and he licked his fingers and he turned the pages and finally, finally, you know, we're going over. He said, all right, well, can we have some money for a house? He said, all right, well, here's the application, kid. <laughs> Gives you a stack of papers. Go home, do some research. And you got to find your pay stubs and bank statements, all this old stuff. You got to fill out this long application, send it to them. Then they ask for more stuff and you fax it to them. It took us two months. Now, it wouldn't probably take two months for most people. For some reason, it just went on and on and on. I, 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 I am so ready for Rocket Mortgage. The whole thing, as little as 10 minutes, you don't go to a bank. All you do is you go to rocketmortgage.com slash twig on your computer, your tablet, your phone. It's that, it, the answer, a couple of questions, you don't even need to do any research. You already know the answer. And then because Rocket Mortgage has trusted partners with all the financial institutions, they can get the information they need with your permission like that. They crunch the numbers based on your income, your assets, and your credit. And within 10 minutes, thereabouts, it'll, they'll analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify and find one that's just right for you. And they put a big green button on the phone that you could show the realtor. We're approved. It's really simple. And it's completely transparent. You'll know exactly what you're getting. You choose the rate, the term, the down payment. Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully. Mortgage confidently to get started go to rocketmortgage.com slash twig rocketmortgage.com slash twig equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and mls consumer access .org, number 3030 couldn't be easier couldn't be faster rocketmortgage.com slash twig you got to admire a company that's on top it's number one and says yep but we can do better rocketmortgage.com slash twig uh Oh, I must be on an old page because it says Google's about to launch a Gmail web redesign. <laughs> That's old. That's old. They did it. <laughs> it's already done. Red One, the new Hydrogen One from Red. Uh, we're trying to get one. Um, if you want to buy one, $1,200. Or if you want the Titanium Edition, $1,600. This is an Android phone unlike any other. 5.7-inch display. Beautiful. That's all? metal case yeah it's not that big is it that's all he says <laughs> and it will be shipped through verizon or at&t that's a big deal for red that that shows that they've because that was something that other companies had a hard time doing and what they're promising is they're the modules so they have these pins at the bottom and they're promising modules somebody like you i would imagine Ant would be very interested in all of this because red has such a great reputation for 4K and 5K I, I was interested until I saw $1,600. Yeah. Well, that's just for titanium. $1,200 for aluminum. I can you know, But then what do what, what will the extra yeah, module cost? That's a cost, good question. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, the chat room knows because they just linked to the Red Lucid 8K camera. Oh. Which suck. I assume you attach the phone to. Um, I know this phone has some kind of holographic for yeah, the type I don't technology, get excited which, about that. The front yeah, I would agree. We've seen agree, that before. My guess is it attaches to this uh, even more expensive 8K camera. All right, let me see if I can find to this. To be used as a monitor? Yeah, a controller. That's it's, what I'm thinking. Somehow it integrates into the, uh, yeah, it's the, a the, red, the red system, right? So yeah, it would so make sense if you were all, you know, if you're a Marcus Brownlee and you're all in on red, <laughs> it would make sense. I don't even think it makes sense for him. Yeah. Because if, what if all this for? phone is going to do is right. is give me an additional monitor to um to see what what my lens is seeing, he has a gazillion monitors in his little closet right there that are all right. vivid quality. Right. You know, he, he's, he's not going to need that. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're overlooking what he's going to get, though. He's going to get that proprietary HV4 format that is exclusive to RED cameras. So your video is going to be in a new format. 
So here's the okay. peta, here's the petapixel uh, art. Yeah, right. It's not it's a good going thing. to be compressed to crap on YouTube. 8K 3D camera for 4V holographic photos. You know you want this, Ant. I don't even know what it means, but I know you I want it. Red, but See, Ant, we have a we have a, we have a game here on Twig. Game. Yeah. Sorry. What should Ant get? No, we we have a game. We try to get Leo to actually buy something ridiculous. Yeah. And make him spend money. So I think our game today is trying to get you to order this before the show is over. <laughs> no is. way. No, we are trying to get this phone for review. I'm not buying it. So <laughs> Lucid makes a $500 3D VR 180 camera. <sighs> so And they're going to work with RED to make this 8K 3D camera. It won't be available to the fourth quarter of 2018. No pricing available. So I like the ambition, but uh, I just don't know that all of that stuff is necessary right now for consumers. Yeah. Um, people people barely give a crap about VR, you know, because it's just not necessarily uh, convenient for people. You know, people so I know what three D is. What's four V? I thought that was the holographic part. Oh, that's part the holographic. It is. Yeah. For Which view, they, they wouldn't let anybody film that at the at, when they showed this off because they said it doesn't translate well on camera, so nobody was allowed to film the 4V stuff. Uh, so I have not seen it. So this is a DL Cade's uh, article in DP Review. I think he's the guy who actually broke this. So let's give DL a credit. Now, here. didn't they also mention the potential of being able to add a image sensor to the back of that phone? To where you can That's put what I another lens, yeah. put another lens on the back of it, and I'd be okay with that. Um, but again, I looked at the bottom line. It cost me twelve hundred dollars for the phone. It's going to cost me X amount of dollars for the image sensor, and I already have a lens. Right. So you're basically just buying yourself a new camera. Yeah. Then why Doesn't not make just sense. buy a new Why camera? put it in the phone? Yeah. No, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because and I like red. Because it's Sorry, sexy. Red, but it's just, just <laughs> that just doesn't make sense to me. Sexy as hell. <laughs> it's sexy. Uh, all right. Moving. So Ant's not buying a Chromebook. He's not buying the red. We're trying. We're, we're failing. <laughs> we're trying to get you to buy something. It's a new game. It is the summertime in the south, and it's all rain and clouds. So I'm just going to keep bringing clouds to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so YouTube launched. Have they launched it? YouTube Music? They launched it, right? Or no? Is it, it still started going out to early early people yesterday? This week, yes. Yeah. 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 YouTube Red is going away. We hardly knew ye. It's being replaced by YouTube Premium. But if you're already a Google Play subscriber, you've got it, right? It's the same thing. Yes, you will have it. You will. You won't. You won't be upcharged or anything. That's correct. You'll be grandfathered in. So, but but do you change brands? Do you no longer use Google Play? Instead, you use YouTube. Well, how does that work? They're gonna actually keep Google Play Music around, but you can now, if you're in the early access program, you can get the YouTube Music app and look at everything there instead. So you could probably use either or until they retire Google Play Music. Um, it is a little confusing, and you know, part of it to me is is a branding thing. There's still, just like we talked about at the beginning of the show, there's a negative connotation in some areas with the word Google, but everybody seems to love YouTube. Yeah, you know, I just All think right. that's that's part of the strategy here. So there's a soft launch started yesterday, ten dollars a month for YouTube Music. Uh, and that service will eventually replace Google Play Music. It's all going to be YouTube Music, but. If you want the ad-free YouTube, that's going to cost more, another $2 a month for YouTube Premium. So $10 for YouTube Music plus $2 for YouTube Premium for ad-free YouTube content. $12 plus, a month. Plus the originals, the new YouTube original stuff from Red. YouTube Music removes ads oh. for music videos only, but not from the rest of YouTube. Right. YouTube Premium at twelve dollars removes ads from everywhere like YouTube Red does. Now, if you're if you're your grandfather, okay, this is the chart they had to make. Your your grandfathered <laughs> they had in, to do that. yeah, your grandfathered in. If you have an existing YouTube Red account, you're going to continue to pay ten dollars a month. Um, so there you have it. 
No news on family plans, and that was something that Ooh, I would need to know. That's a problem. Yeah, I pay for the family plan. Be yeah, nice if our grandfather did on that. That would be good. Google Play tweeted me and said with a nice exclamation point, nothing is changing with Google Play Music, exclamation point. If you have Google Play Music subscription slash family plan, yes. you'll continue to get its benefits. Good. Which means you can keep your health plan. You can keep your health plan. <laughs> Where have we heard? And your before? doctor. Well, that means because that means we still get we get red too, right? Don't we, uh, Aunt? We get we get. That, that's how I. Yeah. That's how I took yeah. it. So we'll because get all I'm the features. Because already paying for red. Yeah. We pay fifteen bucks change. a month, and we get a family plan. We get all the music plus YouTube Red, and we will continue to have that if the tweet is correct. That's how I read it. Thank you, Obama. But that was. A that was a funny, th funny thread that people jumped on after Google sent that to me because they continued to ask questions. And then it got to the point where Google's uh, the, the Google Play Music Twitter account said, yeah, we appreciate all of the feedback. Just go ahead and submit your suggestions and stuff through the feedback captions. And everybody just went nuts. And was like, man, we've been doing that for years. <laughs> your feedback does nothing here, you know. <laughs> all right. Well, good. Thank I'm you. still confused. And of course, I'm going to complain. So I have um, my Google Play stuff is all under my Gmail account because that's all I could get at the time. But my YouTube Red is under my Google G Suite Apps. account. G Suite it's under account. G Suite. <laughs> yeah. Google! <laughs> I don't Newman! put anything under G Suite. No G Suite. Yeah, never I'll tell you right wrong. now, one time my um, my card expired and I needed to switch it over to a new card. And I, I, it just totally slipped my mind. But I went to watch uh, YouTube on the television one day and these ads kept popping up. Oh, isn't it awful? It was, you it was the most annoying. And I'm like, I know I have read. What the heck happened? And then I checked my email. Oh, yeah. Update your card. So it is totally worth oh, yeah. paying that. Extra money for awful. me, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'm rebooting this to see if I can get Linux uh, to go. All right, so there you go. We've confused you even further. Uh, Facebook's nice work, Android app got a little uh, little heat. Oops. We talked about this on um, Security Now yesterday. Uh, looking for super user permissions. Um, Facebook's Android app requesting access privileges, including super user access to a device, which gives it full control over the handheld. This is something new. It's probably a bug. Um, now, I wouldn't be able to see this. I think you'd have to be running the software that gives you that gives you root access, right? Because I super this super user request, I'm not you're not going to see that grants full access to your device to deny if you're not sure it forever. says forever. Forever. Um, okay. Uh, that's a bug, I think. Just maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I don't think... Uh, here's... Yeah, here's Facebook's uh, response. A coding error in one of our anti-fraud systems causes a small number of people running the Facebook app and certain permission management apps on rooted Android phones. Yeah, you'd have to have a rooted, already rooted phone to see a request for additional access permissions. We do not need, nor do we want those permissions. And we have So, our... you know, this is a case where they make a big deal. Oh, my God, Facebook's going after your whole phone. But, yeah, yeah they screwed up on a few phones. Jeez. And, yeah, Who's it doesn't affect people? most people unless you've already rooted no, your phone. No, root phone. Yeah, it is rooted. That's, that's the bottom line there. Yeah. You already, you already, you already got it. Um, all right, good. That's cleared up. We can move on. I actually defend Facebook there yes. for once. So, did you read any notes about Mark's meeting with the European Parliament? I saw some one headline Ugh. said forty questions Mark couldn't answer, but said we'll get back to you. So he's up to that again. Did the other one there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, the four people who went after him the worst, but it also included. Oh, now I've got a senior. Moment. What's the name of the guy who came over? Who did all the Brexit stuff? Who came over and backed Trump? Oh, Farage. Um, Nigel Farage. Farage. So Farage is there. This is the hardest part of it. Farage is there saying, Brexit couldn't happen without you. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> With friends like that. Yeah. <laughs> Who needs Congress? 
I, I heard the format of the whole thing was weird. They basically asked question after question after question for like most of the time and then said, go. And he answered the ones he wanted oh and then he God. ran out of time. That's terrible. Yeah. He kind of got to pick what he wanted to answer What from what I read. I, I did not see the live stream in all fairness, but I kept seeing tweets. He, there's only seven minutes and he has 50 questions to go. Man, that's, I would just filibuster like crazy. Yeah. I think he did because he said, you know, I want to be um, aware of our time. I think we only have a few minutes left. Right. right, <laughs> right. So get well ready played. for a, like a, a digital ad offensive. You might have already seen them from Demand Progress demanding Ugh. that the FTC break up Facebook, that they that Facebook get rid of uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger into their own separate apps. Make Which, it, what does that do? So each app can do the things this, these people make. Well, I don't, I, I'm unclear. Maybe they mean spin it off at a separate company, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so each of those, so there's things they don't like about Facebook. So Facebook, there's now four companies that do things you don't like. How does that fix anything? <laughs> well, they're mm -hmm. they're weaker. They're not they're not they're not all unified under the same roof. So so Didn't so if you're a smaller company, you can do whatever the heck you want. It's just when you get big, is that the problem? Yeah. Now we've now gotten to the essence of it. Only size is the sin. Success is the sin. No, not success. Size. Well, success is size. Uh. Yeah, but the issue is that all of that power under one roof is is risky. You want competition, don't you? Want competition, Jeff? Yeah, but what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say here is that if if Facebook were alone as Facebook without all the other things, everything you, people are complaining about Facebook doing, yeah, still do. Others would still do. <laughs> well, Facebook could still do. <laughs> and would, I mean, would, if you really want to make the argument str stronger, you could say, and this historically has never worked. Just look at the AT and T breakup. And Microsoft. Yeah. Well, they never did break up Microsoft. They wanted to. No, but to. they didn't need to. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Wasn't uh, it rumored that the, the WhatsApp CEO decided to just go ahead and, and bow out because of the privacy practices? Yeah, Yan Coom that were got, going on? got the hell out of there. Uh, you know. Yeah. They're, they're both gone now. One of them was calling for people to stop using Facebook. And then Yan Coom, who was still there, uh, left recently. Um, I mean, that says a lot right there. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to admit, Jeff, that there is there there was a strategic reason for Facebook to acquire those apps and yes. to, uh, and to take Messenger and spin it out. But they're not from making the main blue app yes. because then they they occupy more of your phone surface and they and the, all the notifications and they get more of your eyeballs, they get more of your attention, they get more of your data. So they they see there's a benefit in that. So okay, right, right, but but the, but then then all they're trying to all this organization is trying to do is just punish them. As opposed to identifying a problem and saying, here's a solution. Well, I don't hear the problem, well, and I don't see the solution. I don't know if it's punish them or maybe make them a little less dominant. But, but again, to solve what problem precisely, and then how does this solve that problem? Well, wouldn't you agree that, uh, that having the more information that a single entity has about you, the more effectively they can target you and, and abuse your, you know, your privacy and so forth that if well, you were to split that silo all of that information up into little chunks it wouldn't be as bad the problem no, is it's i still aggregated. think a, a the organization doesn't really identify the problem okay you've identified a problem too much data about me facebook on its own without whatsapp instagram and anything else would all would still be there the complaint oh, would be the same so so what you're saying is they should go even farther no, I'm saying that this is just an effort to uh, get attention. It's never going to happen in this administration. No. It's absolutely ridiculous. And we're giving them what they want right now. Okay, enough. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like the Vorak. <laughs> no, Man. yeah, no, that's okay. We need somebody like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love watching the horns come out. <laughs> how, about, how, how about this one? New York Times article. You we get them really excited now. Amazon is selling... Face recognition to the yeah, police. This is a problem. This is an issue. So uh, Amazon has, for some time now, a service called Recognition with a K, which is a kind of a Kafka esque name, uh, that uh, uses Amazon's cloud services to do face recognition. Uh, Orlando Police Department of Florida, Washington County Sheriff's Office in Oregon have both used it. On uh, yesterday, the ACLU. 
uh, asked Am along with two dozen civil rights organizations, asked Amazon to stop selling recognition to law enforcement because the police could use it for all sorts of nefarious things. I think this is also what, Jeff, I would submit this is similar to what you're talking about. I mean, face recognition can have lots of value, and the Amazon video and showed a lot can play, of... can find missing children and yes. criminals. Disney, and... Di they pointed out Disneyland uses it uh, to find missing kids and, and does a very effective job of it. Um, they, New York Times also admitted in this same article they've used it because it was hard to figure out who was who during the royal wedding. So they they used it to get, mm. you know, face... Ah. That's Princess uh, uh, Ab Abby. She's uh, third generation, fourth removed from the, you know. <laughs> and, of course, remember Google, uh, 300 people quit Google because Google was working on face recognition for the Defense Department, for, drone, for drones. So the problem is face recognition has can have both great benefits. Yeah, the problem is that we problems. don't trust any institution these days, corporate or government. Right. And I think for law enforcement, face recognition can be very valuable. But uh, it's also scary. And and companies, I think, need to have some kind of moral compass for these decisions. I agree. We, we talk about this on tomorrow's IoT podcast because the there was a question about what data is actually being analyzed here. And I think the police departments uploaded like mug shots and other data, other photos they had. The reason we, we talk about it in this way is because you know, you have the ring neighbors thing going with the doorbell, you know right. what I'm talking about, where they can sell, yeah. not sell, but send information to the police in your area, uh, or the police can actually request that information if you're part of the neighbors program to help with a crime. And it has to be an open case file. It can't just be, we want to go look f through the data. Um, but I, my fear is that people just start thinking, well, gee, all the Amazon cameras and, you know, because they have the, they own Blink, which is a camera company and so on. I don't see this being used, at least to my understanding, on that information. It's not like Am Amazon is looking at your camera data and trying to recognize things. Could that happen in the future? Sure. Um, this happens to be law enforcement, and it seems to be a limited set of data. There's definitely perils here, but I kind of felt it was a little overblown in terms of what it, this whole issue was. Well, listen, so, yes, I agree with you. Uh, and this is, I think, like the last story, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but uh, this is, here's a success story. Washington County Sheriff's Office, they're just outside of Portland, Oregon. They set up the system for about 400 bucks. It cost them a few hundred, a few dollars a month to run. One of the first things they did is they fed the recognition system about 300,000 images from the county's mugshot database. Within a week going live, according to the Times, the system was used to identify and arrest a suspect who stole more than $5,000 from local stores. There were no leads before the system identified him. But it could also be used to spot troublemakers. In fact, apparently, I didn't know this, but arenas do this at concerts. Oh. Uh, <laughs> arenas are, are oh, using it to screen for troublemakers at events. The Department of Homeland Security uses it to identify foreign visitors who overstay their visas. So uh, Madison Square Garden has used face scanning technology on customers. That's what that camera is on the metal detector. And when you arrive... <laughs> They're gonna see you in that database and say, "Oh yeah, we had to throw him out last year." I don't, I don't know if I have a problem with that. Do you have a problem with that? I'll, I'll bet, I'll bet the uh, uh, casinos use it. Bet you. Oh yeah. Now there are some issues. For instance, and the Times uh, talks about this, these uh, recognition systems have notorious problems with people of color. An yep. MIT uh, study showed that the gender of darker skinned women was misidentified thirty five percent of the time by face recognition. Uh, software and the issue would be in this case i think the concern would be false positives yeah so that's that's something to be very aware of but i think really what we should i don't know if this is a bad i think this is a potentially good technology that could be absolutely misused and so there needs to be a lot of oversight so you don't regulate technology you regulate the use law enforcement yeah always say yeah <laughs> you know I, I i spoke to you last week when i was in toronto for rights con which is now my favorite conference um which was, i uh, found human, out human they had in, in canada because nobody could get into the united states exactly and then yes. canada blocked a lot of attendees oh i didn't know that yes Ooh. <laughs> next year it's in tunis <laughs> i don't know where it's gonna be maybe, um, maybe Moscow. literally literally next year it's in tunis oh that's so, why so <laughs> but my grand conclusion out of this was I realized that that everything people are screaming, almost everything that people are screaming for Facebook to do, 
it has nothing to do with technology. It has everything to do with human behavior. Yes. And and government, wh where do you regulate human behavior? You regulate human behavior through government or you regulate our norms through families and churches and schools, right? When have we ever said to companies, fix society, change human behavior? We don't, right? But now the, 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 the uh, alleged problem is of such a scale that nobody can figure it out. Government can't figure it out. Government doesn't know how to do its job. So government outsources this and tells Facebook, solve it without defining the problem, witness the previous discussion. Right. And so the entire discussion of RightsCon was what's called intermediary liability, where the intermediaries, the platforms, the phone companies, even, even the, uh, the domain registrars have government coming after them saying, you get them to stop that. And um, it's really an abrogation of government's job. If government wants to regulate human behavior, that's their job, not the companies. But this could is where we're stuck. Go to Facebook. Could government go to Facebook and say, hey, remove the like button from everybody's posts. Just flat out remove it. Only leave a comment field. And we're going to use that as a way to, to help clean up and, and make our society a little bit better because there's so much power in that like. You know, can government do that to Facebook? No, because that would be, be a violation of free speech. But government can say to Facebook, as the, well, government in Germany, government says to Facebook, if someone uses hate speech or mentions Nazis or such, if you don't get rid of it within 24 hours, we will fine you $500 million. Wow. Well, oh. So, so you have the New York Times had a feature, I think it's on the rundown, from the uh, content killing factory that's in yes. Germany now. Yes. Uh, where people are there and they're, they're having to look at horrid stuff uh, to get rid of it because they're, the government is telling them, get rid of that piece of content and that piece of content. And if you don't, if you don't make this judgment, we're going to come after you big time. So basically they get rid of tons of stuff. See, I'm mm. not sure that's really good either. I don't think it is. I don't know what the answer is. I yeah, that's really, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, related to what you're just talking about, the whole regulation of behavior, look at what's going on in China with technology. They are regulating yep. behavior with the technology now. And that's that's where I get scared with this technology, it being misused or used in a way that I don't want to happen. Precisely, Kevin. And you, when, you, when you open up a function for one's allegedly good government, that same function is then available to all governments. And to your point, Ant, is if, if 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 one government demands the ability to change functions on Facebook, then every government can use that. And you can use that in Turkey and Russia and China. But I take your larger point. You think the, the, the like button has ruined society? I think the like button is totally screwing stuff up, especially in the, the younger generation. Because you know, people, they, they, I just look at teenagers in particular and they'll post something in Within five minutes, they're going back to their post to see how many likes they have, you know, let alone the fact that, you know, they got a house on fire behind them or something like that. They, they're they worried about how many likes do I have on this particular post? Yeah, but you can't and make Facebook fix that. I mean, that's a that's a no. societal problem. I, it's a societal thing. We were at but we went to a concert on Friday and uh, we were pretty close to the front. And there was a young woman whose father had brought her it was cute. And they were so proud of the fact that they were in the front row there and. The nice. entire concert, she's got her phone up and is videoing the concert. The entire yeah. concert, block him, my view, by the way, incidentally. And then, you know, in the middle of songs, the singer's on the stage, she's singing, they're, she's right there. They're turning around and doing selfies. And what I finally yeah. realized is, you know, nobody's going to look at that video later. The point of that video, the point of the selfies is to post that on social networks, see how great my life is. Yeah, and I and, yep. and it really made me sad that uh, that all of this was being viewed through this young person's uh, uh, desire to 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 show off on social media, and she wasn't enjoying the concert. She wasn't paying attention to the concert. It was all about here I am at the concert. Look at me, and that's yeah. sad to me. I just felt bad for her. And don't get me wrong, there is a certain aspect of social life of knowing where your friends and family are and, and celebrating it. But Sharing I think it's just, gotten, I agree, but a lot of it is, I think it's just gotten too big. For aren't, that I, now. aren't I, aren't I Look how great my life is. Yeah. You know, and yeah, the I, real and, problem with that is the other kids who think, well, mine's not right. 
right. It's all a there race. It's all a race to 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 cultivate, to polish your image so that you look better than everybody else. But I, I don't think, I mean, admittedly, I mean, I, I often write, you know, rag on Facebook and Twitter because they've become tools for a lot of bad things, but it's not really their fault. They're just the tools, the, the bad Bingo. things. Bingo. Yeah. Can we put this in the history book? Yeah. <laughs> the bad things come from people. <laughs> it's not their fault. Exactly. Using them. Yeah. But and, I, so, and so what makes us think that these platforms, I mean, A, part of the presumption is, well, they made us do it. No, the technology didn't make us do it empowered things. it. Uh, for some, for a certain relatively small number of of, of of actors who are doing the worst things, right? The haters, the misogynists, the ra racists, the fraudsters, the propagandists, the trolls. Right? Here's, that's a relatively small number. Here's to the, what is it? The 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 brilliant ones. <laughs> yeah. It sounds yeah. like a, a dystopian Apple ad. Mm. Here's to the trolls, the haters. <laughs> <laughs> the misogynists. The misogynists. The I'm going to do that. I'm going to make one of those. That's good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Think different. Um, so what do we do about it, though? That's what that really, I fundamentally think that that's what all of these conversations come down to. Yes, we acknowledge. We see this problem. What do we do? And we're. And I think we have to learn to ignore it. I've, I've really, really come to believe that the important thing is to pay attention to quality again. Um, you know, I talked about how 20,000 people on Facebook are there to kill SHIT, 30,000 journalists in American newspapers. What's wrong with that allocation of resources, no matter where it comes from? Mm. And mm. Um, uh, we've got to just recognize what, what we're doing is we're giving the bad guys exactly what they want. Every time we have Joan Donovan on from Data and Society, you know, there, there's a big report. I think I put it on the on the rundown. Uh, tell, trying to educate media about not giving the bad guys the attention that they crave. They're manipulating us at every turn. The more it's it's it's, a, it's it's the one lesson. What's the one lesson of the whole internet age? Don't feed the effing trolls. Yeah, yeah. And we're no and we're feeding them with this attention. Um. Okay. But they don't go away because of that. Well, in a sense, they do. I mean, in a sense. Uh, I mean, I, again, I don't see them in my Facebook feed. Right. I don't. Right. Because well, I, I don't, follow nice I don't people. either because I killed Facebook. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> actually I went back. I had to go back because I missed the tech TV reunion. I almost missed it because the only way they told people about it was on Facebook. <laughs> ah, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Has <laughs> well, I, I'm not happy about it because I, I have to say I could. You, you know, as as always, when you stop using a drug and you go back to it, you can really see the deleterious effect of it. But <laughs> what are you going to do? I think all of that stuff can start with 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 the individuals. So it, it starts with us. But see, ignoring um, so ignoring, I turn off comments. We don't use comments on our pages because we got uh -huh. trolled so much. So is that okay? Uh, is that what yeah, you mean, good Jeff? Question. Is that how you? We're going? letting people. I, I, well, it's unfortunate, but at some point, if you're not going to have the, it would take the resources to um, to deal with the comments. And well, but dealing with point, them is not ignoring it. them. Dealing with them is feeding them. That's what I'm saying. At some point, it's not worth it. Yeah, I mean, isn't it? After, after all, that's negative. Speech. That's negative. Uh, that that that's feedback too. That's attention. That's energy. If you if you they like, won, they yeah. killed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, I'm, 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 I think that's an unsatisfactory answer. I mean, I don't, I know, I don't have a this. better one, but it's an unsatisfactory answer because it's like saying, well, if people are burning your house down, just ignore them. Uh, mm. But they're still burning the house down. Well, it's the problem. So, so Twitter lets you block people uh, and lets you mute people, and they're still. And I, th I find that unsatisfactory. I agree, but it's the tools we have at the ready, and 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 the other uh, opportunity is to answer them. And that's the thing we have given up. Yeah, that doesn't work too well either. <laughs> no, because it doesn't. And it, and it should. We should have the right to say being a jerk. <laughs> Twitter finally, uh, Twitter's getting a lot of heat for updating their uh, API and screwing third-party apps yet again. As usual. <laughs> it's business when as usual. It's a platform. Learn. Yeah. It's uh, it's a platform that's going to be determined that nobody makes any money but Twitter. So there really isn't. It is clear that their goal is that you use Twitter's website uh, and and apps to access Twitter. Right? I mean, I look at um, what's that one app that I used to love using? I think it was called Phoenix. Mm -hmm. 
Twitter app and yeah. ended up having to uninstall it. And when I went back to try to reinstall oh, yeah. it later, F-E-N-I-X. couldn't use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's because Twitter was like, yeah, we're only going to play just nice enough with these guys. Sorry, you missed the boat. You know, and Twitter has every right to do that, but it's still, I don't think it's, here's I don't the, think it's fair. Here's the uh, Icon Factory developers tweeting, the public pricing I'm seeing shows Twitter's account activity API pricing, because you have to pay to get the activity API, $2,899 a month for 250 users. That, you know, that's $10 a user a month to get push notifications on a platform where people balk at spending 99 cents, says Craig Hockenberry. So uh, this is going to be an issue. Uh, Favestar has shut down. Um, Clout shut down. Maybe Clout, I thought Clout might have shut down because of GDPR, but maybe it's because of this too, because they, they won't be able to get that info from Twitter. Um, how many emails, since you brought it up, how many oh. damned emails are you getting right now because oh, of GDP it's great. FNPR? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I thought this oh, was CES. Thank you, season. Europe. <laughs> it's worse than CES. Yeah. On the other <laughs> hand, <laughs> I think there's I thought it was CES time. Are you dead? It, it is very similar, isn't it? Are you dead against GDPR, uh, Jeff? I no, dead against? No, I think it's a badly done law. Dead against? No. We'll see how they um, implement it. Right? It could. Well, that's the problem, and it's and it's very difficult. I, I put on the rundown. Uh, one, um, I think, TV station somewhere in the U.S. Uh, uh, somebody from Oxford went in to try to just find some story that was going on and told, oh, sorry, you're from the EU. We're blocking you uh. because we don't want to take any chances and it would take me 4% of our revenue and we're not doing it. So sorry, until we can figure out this straight out, you ain't coming here. I think that's a good uh, strategy. It's an unintended consequence, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I if, every, the, if everybody uh, did that, that'd be, uh, that'd kind of be the, death now for gdpr it's a, it's in the rundown somewhere people like know. wordpress and and squares squarespace they're they're probably going to make out okay on this because individuals that are out there trying to run their own websites and whatnot it's a whole lot of yep work. that's a good point <laughs> yeah a that's a very good point if you rely on these companies to to do the work you don't have to that's a very good point yeah. All uh, these laws that are aimed at making the big platforms less powerful make them more powerful. Right to be forgotten yeah, makes Google more powerful. That's, right? that's a very GDPR interesting... is going to make Google and Twitter and, and Facebook more powerful. Boy, is that interesting. I didn't think about it that way. That is a very good point. This is what you said, Ant. As a small business owner, you just can't do it. Yeah. Right. Uh, they do have the resources to do it. They'll, they'll manage it. It's kind of what uh, Ben Thompson's been saying. Um. Congress is mulling an extension to the Copyright Act <laughs> to 144 years. This well, we are getting older. Yeah. <laughs> We're living longer. It used to be called the uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Act. Uh, and I think now we call it the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act because uh -huh. it all comes down to the Mickey Mouse copyright. Mickey Mouse was created in... I, I got it. There's a great chart here. Let me see if I can find it. Mickey Mouse was created in 1923, and uh, the copyright law began to see the changes as the Disney Corporation faced the deadline, and they extended it each time. So in, in, uh, in the original Copyright Act in 1790, your copyright was for 28 years, extended uh, a little bit later in 1831 to 42 years. Mickey Mouse was created in 1928. At that time, the copyright was for 55 years. So interestingly enough, 55 years after Mickey Mouse was created, <laughs> Mickey, or actually it was 50 years, 51 years, just in time, the a copyright was extended from 1984. His copyright was extended from 1984 to 2003. Then in 1998, it was extended to 2023, so right now, the Mickey Mouse copyright runs out in 2023 already. Just to, you know, be proactive to get on top of it, Congress is looking at extending it out to, it's now currently uh, 103 years, something 105 years to 140 years. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's all because of, of Disney, not wanting to lose the copyright to Mickey Mouse. And Lawrence Lessig has tried to... 
Oh yep. yeah, L Larry hates it. He's he tried right. to change he's it. Trying to do everything. Years. Yeah, he Everyone finally gave. It was interesting. Lessig, who's a co constitutional lawyer, he's at Harvard, uh, and a great man, creator of yep. Creative Commons. Um, he's been on Twitter a number of times. He was on Twitter a lot in the early days. Uh, Larry eventually gave up. He was trying to f to fix this, and eventually get, realized I can't fix this as long as campaign finance laws are as they are. Right. The, because ultimately the votes go to the guy with the biggest, deepest pockets. So he's changed his tack. Uh, he tried to do this in the last election. He ran for president to uh, get rid of, to change campaign finance, to, to, to you know, yeah. reform this. And his plan was, I'll get, elect me president. Since no incumbent will change, will reform campaign finance, elect me president. I will reform campaign finance. I'll pick a really good vice president. And, re and and then resign. <laughs> Let that person run it. I don't want the job, he's saying. I just want to be the guy who fixes campaign finance. <laughs> Takes the big money out of politics. Unfortunately, he didn't even have a chance. I don't think he made it to the debates. No, so, he didn't. No. Did you, speaking of politics, you see who's working for Netflix? Who? Michelle and Barack Obama. Oh. Signed mm -hmm. a deal to produce programming for Netflix. <laughs> It spurred it, it's lots the, and lots of hate and boycott. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Man. Really? They're coming out of the woodwork, man. Oh, man. And woodwork yeah, is you know, where what, they belong. Oy. And I wonder how much <laughs> tweet and media amplified it. Yeah, it might have just been 100 tweets. And 100 tweets looks like a lot. I, yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah, true. True. Um, so they're going to do... Uh, uh, I guess, I guess I gather documentary programming. Obama's will and I produce say why not? scripted Two series, unscripted people. series, docu-series, documentaries, and features. What this release from Netflix tells me is they no one knows what they're going to do, but we, <laughs> we, we got them. They that's, got their name. We got the name. We got them, and that's what matters. We got them. Uh, that's funny. That's funny. I think, you know, this is the new second act, going to work for Facebook. I mean, uh, Netflix. Well, that's I'm next time, too. I, th I think uh, well, when, when Trump's out of office, he'll go to work for Twitter. Twitter. He ought to. <laughs> yeah, he ought to. He ought to. He ought to. Who was one of the earliest, uh, well, oh, what was his name? Uh, which one Which one was it? The earliest celebrities on Twitter who Ashton insisted Ashton Kutcher. Twitter, Ashton Kutcher insisted that Twitter owed him a fortune because he made them. Yeah. I had somewhere, uh, we, Kevin Rose was on the new screensavers a couple of weeks ago. And in the early oh, days yeah. of Twitter in 2007, Kevin and I were in a race yeah. I was number one on Twitter with 30,000 followers. <laughs> and he was slowly coming up. I, number two, I was number one. Barack Obama, who was a candidate but not president yet, was number two. Right. Kevin Rose was number three. Eventually, <laughs> eventually Kevin Rose beat me and Barack. And I can call him Barack because we're Twitter buddies. And, uh, and But then none of it mattered because along comes Ashton Kutcher, and then that was all over. He was the first to a million, I think. Oops. <laughs> the city of Lake Worth, Florida, sent out a zombie alert. <laughs> Florida man, <laughs> about Florida one dead man. one forty-five in the morning on Sunday. Uh, projected repair time, power outage, and zombie alert for residents of Lake Worth and Terminus. There are now far less than seven thousand three hundred eighty customers involved due to extreme zombie activity. <laughs> Restoration time <laughs> uncertain. Uh, Terminus is a city in The Walking Dead. So yeah, it who was lost in, their job after it, this. It was intentional. Power was out for 27 minutes, but uh, and Ben Kerr, who is the uh, city's public information officer, said, "I want to reiterate, Lake Worth does not have any zombie activity currently, <laughs> and I apologize <laughs> for the system message. We're, we're and we're looking into it. <laughs> I like how you put that qualifying in there. Currently, currently." <laughs> As far as we can tell, you, you got to you got to you got to couch that, Ant. You know, you could, you don't want to be right. Allegedly, you never know. Allegedly, <laughs> allegedly is good. Yeah, according to sources. All right, somebody stuck this in. I don't know who did. Um, this is our video of the week. I did. I love this. It is uh, the queen at the royal wedding, sitting next. She she wore a green screen. Oh, she wore green. <laughs> it was a green dress. Oh. So for those of you who can only hear, the green dress is being used with all these wonderful graphics behind. It's a light show. A right. light show. Wait, I win. Isn't that great? Uh, I love that.
I love that. The but queen is so badass, though. Why is perfect. it, though? By the way, I just want to point this out, and I don't think it's anything I do. Every time I play a video on YouTube, I get recommendations. You can show this for bikini rich content. Is it just me? Well, I, think so. yeah. I just watched a video about the Queen of the England. Queen. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Laporte. When what? I'm not signed in to my YouTube and I actually just go there to browse something, it does the same thing to me. So when it has I'm nothing not to do with in. anybody. It's just they just know. Yeah. The algorithm knows. That's what Wait people really want. That was a nice yeah. cover for him, Ant. Thank you, Ant. <laughs> Thank you, Ant. If I'm signed in, I don't get those recommendations, but I have noticed a lot of Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues uh, <laughs> popping up on my screen recently. Reminds me of the first podcast expo I went to. Somebody came up to me and said, I got a brilliant idea. You guys really got to get into this. I said, what? He said, three words, bikini-rich content. <laughs> so plastics yeah man plastics plastics all right let's uh we it's time to wrap this up we've been, we've been going for a while hmm. and i'm at the end of the rundown uh unless some um, somebody has something they want to uh stick in here no we did chromebooks what, what more do you need what more do we right, need Kevin? so i'm what i'm gonna do is we do this every week we give you a chance to pick something or or talk about something uh anybody aunt do you want to start it off you got a pick of the week uh sure normally you know i'll come on here and i'll plug my youtube channel and and, and stuff like that but i want to plug tech republic first of all but secondly some people may not realize that may is the mental awareness month ah. um and i i just want to reach out to everybody here on the twit network um that's watching it and just say hey take take some time and and be aware of the mental awareness um, month. And, and if you know someone that's dealing with it and having issues with it, try to help them get some help. This is something very near and dear to my heart. And it's, you know, I'm, I have no problem going public with it and stating that Mrs. Pruitt, she suffers from major depression, depressive disorder. Aww. And, um, <clears throat> and it's a battle at times. Mm -hmm. And um, but she's but she's strong and she's fighting and she does everything she does she can do, and she's she has your support to herself, right? Mm -hmm. And she's been doing everything that she can this month to try to help raise awareness awesome? um, for this disease. Good so mm -hmm. just take five seconds if you can and just just amen. Not don't brush this stuff off. You know we just the other day there was a an accident here in my town. And it ended up being because of a mental disorder. A uh, gentleman was having dinner with his family, Sunday dinner with his family in the restaurant. He gets up and leaves from the table because he has anxiety issues. And he gets in his vehicle and drives into the restaurant oh. and, mm -hmm. and hurt a lot of people, oh, including killing his family. Oh my and it's, God. And it's because he... he oh has a mental disorder so folks please take a moment and and just recognize the fact that mental disorders are real and it's an and illness you're so right and it's an mm -hmm. illness and thank yes. you for sharing that Ant. because i yeah i think one of the things that happens is so stigmatized uh that people don't talk about it uh in their lives and the truth is once people talk about it Everybody has an experience. You find out everybody has it exactly. There has some yep. some something. Yep. And have you do you go to VidCon? Haven't been to VidCon yet. I I, I uh, where do you live? By the way, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, well it's a little closer than I am in New York. Uh, I recommend <laughs> it. I think it's I think it's an amazing conference. But 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 the best thing that I ever do at VidCon every year, they have uh, usually two mental health panels where YouTubers mm -hmm. who have bravely, just as you did, bravely talked on YouTube about their own or their loved ones, uh, depression or anxiety or addiction or eating disorder. And they've already done that to the world on YouTube, but they, yeah. they're there on stage with a therapist on stage. Uh, Katie Martin, I think, right? I'm forgetting her name suddenly. Um, and then in the room are, 300, 400, mainly young people, mostly young women, who share that. And the empathy mm -hmm. is incredible. And the mm -hmm. value of 
sharing and being open and helping somebody else is just so apparent in that room. So thank you for bringing this up. You're absolutely right. We all know someone who needs that support and needs that help. Thank you. CureStigma.org if you, I mean, there, the stigma mm -hmm. is the thing I think that really, uh, really hurts because it's an illness. Because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. We treat it as something other than an illness. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, if somebody's sick, uh, you get treatment, you get help, uh, you know, people understand it, there's sympathy, but mental illness is often treated as something, some sort of uh, moral deficiency, and it's not. It's just a physical illness. It's uh, chemical. It's chemical. Yep. And, and, yep. and it's a physical illness like cancer uh, or anything else, and uh, there should not be a stigma. And I think if we get rid of the stigma, I think people can, uh, can, can seek help. Uh, and and will not live in um, in darkness and uh, yeah boy I'm glad you brought that up. CureStigma.org is a good place to uh, start. Uh, Mr. Kevin Tofel, your selection of the week. Well, I, I can't follow that up with a lame Chrome OS. Uh, oh sure you can. Web extension. <laughs> oh well, sure no, you actually, can. Actually, I can't. I can't. Uh, I'm going to okay. say something, and I don't, I'm not saying it as out of sympathy. I'm thrilled that Ant brought this up. Um, I folks don't probably know this. I lost my father to uh, suicide uh, oh, through sorry. depression right. in 2009. And I've actually been on depression medication since 2011. And it is a struggle every day. And again, I'm not saying this for sympathy. This is my fight and I fight it every day. And yeah. uh, you're right, Leo, the stigma has to go away. This is an illness. And, you know, everybody's mind works differently and everybody has to deal with things in different ways. And uh, just be there for people, support people. And thank you so much for bringing this up. I really appreciate it. It was nice. perfect timing. And thank, so, thank you, you, Kevin. That's 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 generous to do. Yeah. Well, it it is what it is. It's reality, Jeff. And I, yeah. I don't shy away. I never have shied away from reality. Not in my writing. Not on video. Yep. And uh, right. you know, there was just never an opportunity to say, "Hey, let me talk about this." So here it was. I took it. Good. And uh, I hope people really do take it to heart. Not just this month, but all the time. Yeah. Thank right. You. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, you got a number? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, have, I have five depressed relatives. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, That's a good number. Uh, yeah, let me, let me first plug, uh, since we're on uh, 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 disturbing things, uh, Data and Society, our friend Joan Donovan, uh, who, who tweeted me she loved last week's show. Um, Data and Society, which watches out for manipulation in media, has a new report out. Uh, called The Oxygen of Amplification by Whitney Phillips, uh, which is about uh, how media uh, spread these things. And, and, and there's a precedent for media watching what it says, which is, which is suicide. Um, that the norm in journalism is to report the fact, but not the means, because there are copycats, there are people who get inspired, and it doesn't accomplish anything. It's a lesson we haven't learned when it comes to mass killers. And it's a lesson we haven't learned when it comes to propaganda, manipulation, and trolls. Uh, so this is an important report, and I, and I recommend it. Um, but then I'll give you a real number, which is that Starbucks, surprisingly, wins mm -hmm. the mobile payment derby. Uh, more people are using Starbucks mobile payment than Apple Pay, Google Pay, or Samsung Pay. Guess why? Because Starbucks comes with caffeine. <laughs> you know the greatest legal addictive drug in si in history <laughs> yep. yep why didn't i think of that 20 years ago i think i need to start up a third wave coffee shop here and put some mobile payments behind it and i'm going to be a very rich man yeah yeah my uh, <laughs> Bitcoin, recommendation Bitcoin. go ahead Anything? no i was just saying and go, go bitcoin really Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you can use that monster machine behind you to to, to mine a lot of them. The yes, I can. <laughs> the, the Bitcoin coffee shop. That's a good idea. Uh, I want to just put in a plug for something that uh, we installed at Google I.O., a lot of us. Uh, and if you have been afraid, I just want to say do it. And that's Android P. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, now, not every phone can do it. But if you have one of the phones that can, and it's really a large number, including the Essential phone, of course, the Pixels, the Nokia 7, the OnePlus 6, the Oppo, the Sony, uh, Vivo, and Xiaomi. Uh, P is awesome, and it's ready. I mean, I have not had any problems with it. It works really beautifully. I had a few minor bugs. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I had one hard reboot. It didn't show reboot. me all my apps, and then it did. When yeah. I click on some notifications, it doesn't really grow the notification. These are minor as can be. And the new UI, this slidey UI, is awesome. It's nice. I thought I was going to mm -hmm. be sticking my tongue out trying to figure out, how do I do that? But it's uh, <laughs> it works. No, if you've, if you've been putting it off, uh, I think it's a fair thing to do if your phone supports it. I'm using it on a Pixel 2 XL, and I and I wouldn't even I wouldn't go back. It's just really nice. They did. A and great you have job. a switched launchers again. You're sticking with the Android. I'm sticking with the Pixel launcher, which is a, a actually Yay. a big statement because I've been using that's third a, party that's, launchers that's forever. Progress for Leo. <laughs> yeah, that's a good sign. Well, it just now, means can you know you quickly can you quickly access the camera with the whole double click on the power oh, button? Oh, that's a good question. That uh, that's important. Yeah, you could you could with the uh, yes. You can. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give it a run. Then. So that's, you know, that's a, I don't know if that's a Android feature as much as a pixel feature, but um, it's, that's a very nice feature. I agree. Yeah. You want to get right to the camera. Do you use a pixel two? I have a pixel two XL, sir. Such a nice camera. Oh, love it. It makes me wonder love why I Google. bring other cameras with me. It's such, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, I have to, but it's just, I feel like, wow, I could probably do I've this. I've done, I, I've done, um, photos with it and have sold images that were shot with the pixel I've, i even really? did a headshot session with the pixel for a client wow see that's it's the that real good. problem is the clients clients go what you're not you're not gonna yeah, bring well, yeah, what did your client think of that <laughs> oh he loved it really loved really it. really i'm shocked I, mean, I come in there i had my camera and i had my tripod and lights and all of that and i snapped a few with the camera but then i said you know what i'm going to also use this camera to um, this phone to do some of your shots as well. And I got a hunch, you're going to like these just as much. And he did. And oh. sure enough, the one that's been published everywhere is from that pixel. I, uh, when we were in Japan a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I used the pixel a lot. This is a photosphere that I created with the pixel. It's a very famous uh, Japanese garden. And uh, I have to say, I think the quality and the fact that I could do a photosphere with it for one thing, uh, and the quality of it made this the camera to use, you know, for for this place. It was very easy to quickly shoot this photosphere with it. Did I, you still carry your big heavy camera? I did. I did. And I took a lot of pictures with it. But, I, you know, I find that many of the pictures I look at again and again came from the Pixel 2. Kevin, what do you carry these days? It was funny you ask. I actually was um, just thinking back to the last time I carried a DSLR, which was probably CES a couple of years back. I just carry phones now, and I, I do a wield between iOS and Android. So I have a an old Pixel XL and an iPhone 10. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had took a I lot of iPhone pictures as well. But I have to say, that just as I'm slightly in favor of the of the Pixel Two of the yeah. two. Yeah, yeah, it's a great yeah. camera. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been a fun twig. We want to thank Ant Pruitt for stopping by. Yeah, Tech yeah, Republic yeah, yeah. Always We always love you. having thank Ant you. on. Yeah, and his, thank you. Thank and his you so mighty, much. his mighty machine, his mighty <laughs> water cooled beast. No, uh, no, no, air cooled. Air cooled. Air. Cool. air. <laughs> oh, aren't you like? That's why living, it's so noisy? You like living dangerous. All those fans, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to plug, uh, Ant? You, your Friday I'm night just, videos. Check out uh, techrepublic.com and, and just check out all of my, my stories that are over there. A lot of photo photography related stuff, but I have a few enterprise IT things in there too. Nice. And then um, jump on my uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ant Pruitt and just go watch some of my stuff over there. I actually have a giveaway on uh, one of the videos nice. uh, for the people that are interested in some photography gear. It's I have fun to watch the Friday nice Night Live. Strap. You can watch uh, Ant work. An hour and 17 minutes of Ant editing editing photos. That's awesome. That shot right there is, um, that was shot with the Pixel as well. What? Jeez. Yep. Wow. That's a hard and shot that's to get. Pre, that's pre-editing right there. Wow. That's a hard shot to get because it's two lights that would probably be very bright. So watch Ant work Friday night live. Thank you, sir. Kevin Toffel is uh, the editor-in-chief of a brand new site about Chromebooks.com that has become the, immediately became My the place hero. to go. Yeah, really <laughs> yeah, awesome. I'm totally digging this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can also hear him with Stacey Higginbotham on uh, the IoT podcast. Yep. Yeah, the about Chromebooks.com site. Anytime you want to hose up your Pixel book or whatever with Linux, this is the place <laughs> to go. I still, I mean, you know, I rebooted it. I got rid of Mosh. For some reason, it's, it just... It's not doing it. You got to get that secure shell going. I'm telling you. Yeah, I want to. <laughs> I want to. I'm going to. 
All right. I'll read all uh -huh. the how tos. I'll get it going. Just, right. just go ahead and wash it, and then do it. Power wash it and do it again. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what. What do you have? You don't really store it. Yeah, it's fine. There's nothing it's on in here. The cloud. I don't mind power cloud. washing. I can wa power wash it all. Yeah, day. exactly. All day. I just got some new underwear though that I can't power wash. <laughs> wait, wait a so minute. So don't. Okay, don't buy. <laughs> Now you know it's the end of the week. What? Don't buy underwear on Instagram in the middle of the night. So this is one of the hazards of late night surfing. Uh, Instagram uh, ads uh. seem somehow magically... I, I buy the stupidest things. So I saw this ad for underwear. It's made out of eucalyptus trees. No, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it's very Come nice and away. soft and stretchy, okay? Looks really comfortable, so I bought five pairs, $20 uh. each. And Whoa. Then, yeah, I know. I know. Whoa. I know. It was the middle of the night. I don't know. I, I was. You so have that, very precious junk there. Man. I do. I want to, you know. <laughs> Only the best for yours. Family jewels must be encased in velvet. But <laughs> I open the box and it says, "Be sure," like a big thing, be sure to read the care instructions before you wash your underwear. I thought, oh, God, what does this mean? You can all, Maybe it's because it's made at a, at, a, at a eucalyptus tree. I don't know. But you can only wash it. Man. On the delicate cycle in cool water and, and cool dry. It's like, well, that's no good. Well, that's not doing good. That's no good. I'll be right back. Let me go get that bag of magic beans I had. <laughs> Just buy an Instagram ad. I'll be there, baby. I don't even want to tell Leo, you what I bought Leo, last night. Oh. Did you buy a bunch of Capitan Monte on the QVC back in the day? No, I was never. I would never fell for the shopping TV. <laughs> but there's something about those Instagram ads. They're, they're really work, don't they? Am I wrong? Am I the only one who does that? Yes, Leo. You're the yes. only one who does. Really? Kevin, do you have eucalyptus underwear? Things. No. Ed, do you have eucalyptus underwear? I'm pretty I sure I don't. I almost bought <laughs> I bamboo don't. stuff too, but I, you know, I thought. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> we do Twig every Wednesday, 1:30 Pacific, 4:30 Eastern, 20:30 UTC. If you want to watch, you please do. You can watch us make it live at twit.tv slash live. Join us in the chat room if you do that at irc.twit.tv. But of course, we know you've got a life, and maybe it's easier for you to listen at your convenience or watch at your convenience. You certainly can do that. We have on-demand versions of every show we do available at twit.tv slash twig for the this show. Uh, you can also subscribe. Just search for Twit or Twig in your uh, podcast app and subscribe, and that way you'll get every episode the minute it's available. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on This Week in Google. Bye.